we are on track. Okay. Very good. So um, again, thank you for your time. Uh, the purpose of the presentation presentation today, I hope, will be informative for you. Uh, it can be a conversation where I share with you some advice and information about the uh, graduate law admissions process, particularly uh, the personal statement and the interview. These are two very important pieces of the admissions process that I think if you spend a little bit of time preparing for, uh, you can position yourself to make a very strong impression uh, during uh, the admissions process to the admissions committee. <clears throat> so we'll get started, the substance of the presentation, but first I want to just introduce myself. My name is Andrew Horsfall. I'm the Executive Director of International Programs and Initiatives here at Syracuse University College of Law. Uh, I oversee our international programs, which includes a semester exchange program, we have a two-year program, it's an accelerated JD program for foreign law graduates, as well as a master's of law program for uh, foreign law graduates as well. I'm also an alum of Syracuse University, both at the undergraduate level as well as the law school from 2010. So I spent much of my time since graduating from law school in the international legal education space. And it's a pleasure to share uh, some of my advice uh, that I've learned along the way with all of you. Just to give you a brief orientation of where I'm sitting now and where Syracuse University is located, uh, you should be able to see um, on your screen, this is a map of uh, the northeast part of the United States. Syracuse is highlighted in orange. Uh, and you can see we're in upstate New York, about one hour by plane from New York City. It's about four and a half hours uh, by car. Uh, but we're, we're far enough away from some of the major cities like Boston, like New York and Philadelphia, but close enough to where you can visit for a long weekend. You can also see here, um, this is our uh, main campus, main university quad area. We have, I think, 11 schools and colleges at the university. We're a tier one private research university, and the law school is located right here on our uh, main campus. So a little bit about the types of graduate law programs uh, that you may be interested in, that, that you may find are options for you as you think about coming to the United States to study. I just listed here a few of our more common graduate degrees. Uh, the JD, the Juris Doctor, is the most common for our American students, and it's certainly um, common for our foreign law graduates as well. So tradi traditional three-year degree. We have our accelerated JD, which I mentioned earlier. This is a two-year program specifically for foreign law graduates. Uh, we have a master's of law program, which is a one-year program usually. Sometimes there are uh, three semesters or four semesters uh, LLM programs, um, but typically the traditional format for the master's of law is a one-year program. And then there's also the doctoral level, PhD level, SJD or JSD degree. Uh, so depending on where you are in your personal, professional, academic uh, careers, any one of these programs may be an option for you. And what I've gone ahead and done is included a, uh, a, just a, a bar here to let you know that for all of, these, um, uh, all of these programs, a personal statement will be required, and we'll talk about why that's the case uh, in a few moments. Um, and then an interview is common for most of these, particularly because the admissions committee wants to gain a better understanding of you and your goals for the program. Because you're a foreign law graduate, you have a foreign law degree, you have a few more options in front of you, uh, more so than a traditional American student. And so uh, we, use the, we use the interview for a variety of reasons, particularly to find out and make sure that the program you're applying into is the best fit for you and perhaps to make recommendations on other programs as well. So you can see here for the typical JD degree, the three-year degree interview is not so common, but more common for the other, for the other graduate uh, and law degrees. <clears throat> Briefly, I uh, just want to give you a frame of reference in terms of the application. Um, obviously, you would be working on all of these materials and pieces of information throughout the admissions process for, for all of your programs. Uh, today, we will be focusing on specifically the personal statement and the Skype or the personal interview. 
Uh, these, I think, are the more interesting pieces of the application review process. You can see here we, we need your transcripts and a resume and perhaps test scores. Um, those things tend to be less interesting uh, to me personally. I really like to uh, get to know you as an applicant and uh, hopefully have a personal conversation with you to learn more about uh, you and your goals and um, how best we can, we can help you along the way. So just some advice here um, I give to all students, you know, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. Um, use the personal statement and the Skype interview. These are strategic touch points for you during the admissions process to tell your story, to uh, communicate perhaps why this school might be best for you. Uh, or why this program might be the best option for you, and then also just to make a personal connection with the school. Uh, so there's, there's a few opportunities to do that along the way, um, and I think, like I said, the most important, the most valuable are the personal statement and the Skype or the personal interview piece. So moving forward, um, <clears throat> This is a lot of information. It's, it looks like a lot of text, but I'll go through with it. I'll go through it with you. Um, I think uh, very, uh, very easily. Um, first, just in terms of an inside admissions perspective for the personal statement, the purpose of the personal statement, um, for me at least, it's the it's the second thing that I read when I open the file, when I review the application. I always start with your CV or your resume. Generally, that will give me a basic chronology of you uh, and your, your academic and your professional background. But the second thing I read, a little bit more important than that, is the personal statement. Because again, it's you in your own words telling me your story. And that's really what I look for, is uh, you know, why is it that you're looking to pursue this program? And also, why perhaps are you looking to come to Syracuse uh, or to, or to um, study a particular field of law? Of law. Uh, what I've done here, and, and hopefully this is some helpful practical advice for, for all of you, I have uh, given you a, a basic roadmap, a basic um, structure for what a personal statement should look like, a successful, I think, compelling personal statement, uh, would start with a brief background of yourself. So unlike the resume where you're listing a chronology of your work, um, take an opportunity in the first one or two paragraphs to just give me a narrative, give me uh, some, some context into what you're currently doing. Uh, the next piece of the personal statement is to tell the reviewer, a person like myself, uh, why are you seeking this particular program? So why the Masters of Law? Why the two-year JD? Or why the doctoral SJD degree? What is it about this program in your own uh, personal and professional career trajectory uh, that makes this particular program uh, the natural next step for you? Um, and so I, 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 it's something that we'll talk about later in the interview. But again, you know, my goal is to make sure that you're applying into a program that is the best fit for you. Uh, and if sometimes we have a conversation and realize that, you know, maybe maybe the LLM isn't the right fit, but perhaps the two-year JD would be a better fit, that's where we like to have those conversations and, and help guide you along the way. Um, so after you've talked about uh, the particular graduate program, uh, then, you know, I, I'm always interested in at least one paragraph or a few sentences, and for me at least, you know, why why Syracuse Law? Is there something about our program or our uh, our academic offerings or other other factors that might have compelled you to apply to Syracuse? Um, we'll talk about this a little bit later, very briefly, but we ha we tend to have specific specializations in technology transfer, IP, national security, so. If there's a particular specialization that you're gravitating toward or that you're interested in, I want to know that um, because it will help me then uh, make some connections for you down the road uh, as an applicant, as an admitted student. Um, and so I'm always looking, I'm always curious to know particularly why have you applied to Syracuse or any other law school that you've chosen to apply to. Uh, other pieces of the personal statement, um, if there are any gaps in your resume, maybe there's uh, you know, two or three years of, of time where you haven't accounted for either education or, or professional experience, maybe explain that a little bit, that any opportunity to clear up any confusion 
that may be uh, in your, your personal statement would be helpful. Um, or if you have um, in your professional, uh, excuse me, in your academic background, if you have a semester or a year perhaps that was uh, maybe just, just a bad year, maybe a poor GPA, poor academic performance, or something else um, that you think you should address, feel free to do that in your personal statement. You can do it either as part of your statement, so either within your main personal statement, or you can always add a separate addendum, a separate page or two to describe the particular circumstances. Um, this can be something good that you want to highlight for us, or it can be something that you think might be problematic, but you'd like to give a little bit more explanation. So certainly, uh, err on the side of caution, and feel free to share as much information as you would like if you think it would help the uh, admissions reviewer uh, make a determination uh, and, and gain a better understanding of, uh, of you as the applicant. So, And then, of course, any other information you think is compelling, if you have a particular alumni connection to the school, if you have a connection with uh, any of our current students or faculty, perhaps you've met with or worked with some of our faculty in the past, uh, any opportunity to make a personal connection, as I was saying earlier, um, or just let us know a little bit more about you and your profile is simply helpful for us. Um, so I hope this, in terms of the inside advice and perspective, as well as the structure of the personal statement itself, uh, will be helpful to you in sort of navigating how to approach the personal statement. There are some tips here, and again, uh, a lot of <laughs> a lot of text on the on the slide, but I think it's all compelling and worth sharing. Uh, so I just want to go through it with you very briefly. Um, first is don't overthink it. You know, this should be your personal story. It's it's a story that only you know uh, the best for yourself. Uh, so it should be fairly easy to write. I think if you stick within the structure that I presented earlier, you should find that um, it should all sort of come together naturally. Um, be concise, but be complete. So students always ask, um, you know, how long does the personal statement need to be? There's no required length for the personal statement for, for most cases. Um, unless a school says a personal statement must be two pages or three pages or one page, um, err on the side of, you know, uh, less is more. Um, a one-page personal statement is completely sufficient. That's, that's totally fine. I think as long as it accomplishes the goals of, um, of sharing your story with the reviewer. Um, I, tend to, I tend to advise students avoid anything longer than two pages. I think anything beyond that, it just becomes um, perhaps more than, uh, more than the reviewer uh, would like to see, uh, unless certainly there's a compelling reason for it. Be personable. Uh, again, the personal statement should do more than just um, give us a chronology of, of what's on your resume or your CV. Um, tell us your story, make it, make it personal, and tie it, tie your interest in the program and the school in with your own personal and professional background. Uh, look backward for now. So this is this is interesting advice uh, that that I think. Uh, most of you maybe haven't had in the past, and it's, it's my general approach to the personal statement is um, I would like you to give me, give me as the reviewer, a sense of why now in your life have you decided to pursue this program. So walk me through a bit of your history. Tell me why at this point uh, in your academic career, your professional career, why now is the, the LLM or the JD the next natural step for you? We will talk later in the interview about your goals for the future, but I, I genuinely think that the personal statement really should give me a, um, a nice history and walk me up to the present uh, as to why you are um, applying to this program. You know, many students will spend a lot of time in their personal statements on all of the wonderful things they will do after graduation. You know, and I read a lot of personal statements where students will write that they, um, you know, want to do these, these amazing things and, um, you know, they might <clears throat> provide me some information about their professional goals. That's interesting and that's certainly helpful to know, but I wouldn't wait, I, I wouldn't spend time in your personal statement on a lot of that because um, we'll, we'll focus on that in the interview. Okay, so I say look backward for now because um, give me a bit of your history and we'll focus on the future during our, our conversation. 
Uh, be authentic. I think this is really important, especially for for um, students coming from countries where English is not the first language. We as reviewers, we can usually tell if uh, your personal statement was drafted by somebody else. Uh, now, I'm not saying uh, you know your personal statement should be a solitary exercise where you, you, you avoid uh, getting perspective and guidance from other people. I think it's helpful to have advice from your colleagues, your, your law professors, perhaps fellow uh, students as well, um, certainly for proofreading and editing and things of that nature. Um, but it, it happens fairly, fairly commonly. You can, you know, look at a, uh, you can look at an application, you can see that a TOEFL or an IELTS score is in a certain range that may be lower, and so the expectation is that the personal statement may have some deficiencies, but if it's perfectly written with language that we don't commonly use here in the U.S., it does tend to um, raise a little bit of an eyebrow, a little bit of caution that perhaps your personal statement was written by somebody else, and so we just want to avoid that, um, that sense of uh, perhaps confusion um, along the way. So, so make sure that it's something that is, is your work, your voice, um, and uh, it, it should be a pretty smooth review of the personal statement. Uh, last, lastly, um, proofread for common errors. Um, you know, certain grammatical mistakes are, are acceptable. That's okay. Certainly, you want to avoid too many grammatical errors. Uh, but you know, if you're applying to Syracuse, but you leave Georgetown in there, or Columbia, or um, Penn State, you know, wherever. Um, it just shows a little bit of a lack of attention to detail. And so, again, just give your personal statement a thorough review one last time to make sure that a few of those common uh, editing errors are um, taken care of. Okay? So that takes us out of the personal statement and on to the interview. And so in similar fashion, I want to give you my inside perspective on how I approach the interview. Uh, while the personal statement, as I was saying, usually will review your history and bring me up to the present. Uh, I personally use the interview as a valuable opportunity to discuss your plans, to discuss your future, really, um, <clears throat> as well as goals for the program. So uh, I'm looking to make a personal connection with you. This should be an informal conversation. Uh, I always tell the applicants, you know, don't be nervous. I'm sure it, it can be a little bit nerve-wracking to appear for an interview, particularly if it's if it's live and there's video involved. Uh, but but I want the students to be comfortable. I want you to be um, able to really open up to me a bit. And certainly, I I want to be able to share information with you about the admissions process. Uh, the program, any questions that you might have. Uh, this is really an opportunity to just have a nice conversation uh, and, uh, and really tie up the, the end of the admissions process. So <clears throat> I've provided here um, in similar format a, a bit of a, a structure to the interview. This is how I conduct my interviews of students, and I think this is a fairly common way to do it. Um, you know, I always open with a bit of a um, housekeeping, housekeeping matters. Uh, we'll make sure the internet connection works. I always tell my students, you know, if we lose connection, I'll turn off my camera uh, or I'll call you back. And you sort of set those sort of initial um, details aside just to put everyone at ease. Uh, and then we talk about perhaps the length of the interview, some of the expectations. I'll do a brief introduction of myself. Uh, just to make sure that um, there's a, a level of comfort there. Uh, and that doesn't take more than maybe two or three minutes. And then I usually ask you know, a sort of vague question ge that generally the applicant just introduce themselves. So in this case, you'd want to be prepared to uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Now, opening with, you know, my name is John Smith, not really necessary. I have your application in front of me. I reviewed it. But more so, just tell me a little bit about what you're currently doing. If you're if you're working, I'd like to know about your current job, your daily responsibilities, things of that nature. If you're in school, walk me through a typical day of your 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 undergraduate program, and just bring me up to the present. <clears throat> and then there'll be a few follow-up questions. I have a few questions that I like to ask, 
you know, I'm usually interested in your law school, so I'd like to know about your law school, any activities you participated in during your prior legal education. I might ask you if you're currently working, uh, questions about um, the types of legal issues that you're handling, the types of work that you're actually doing. Uh, and then we move into the goals that you have for the program. So academically, I'm interested in the types of subjects you'd like to study, like to take. Um, if you're interested in, say, maritime law or space law, you know, that's helpful for me to know because we don't offer many courses in those subjects. But if you're interested in a variety of other areas, um, certainly that's helpful for me to know. I can make faculty connections for you, make personal connections for you. Um, and so I like to get a sense of what you would like to accomplish during your academic program. And then going a bit further, I always like to, to have a conversation with you about your goals after. So be prepared to, to, um, to explain a bit about um, your goals in the program, perhaps you'd like to do some pro bono volunteer work, perhaps you would like to do some research work with a professor, uh, but then also be prepared to, to, to give us a little bit of a, uh, a synopsis of your, your personal goals. Some students want to stay here, study for the bar exam perhaps, maybe do an internship. Some students already have a job waiting for them when they return home. So there's, there's a range of options. I think everyone tends to do something different. It's helpful for me to know uh, at this point in the admissions process a little bit about where you see this program taking you. Uh, and, and to the extent I can be helpful in giving you advice on that, that's, that's a good opportunity for me to do that also. So, um, I mean, that takes up most of the interview time. By then we get to about 15, maybe 20 minutes. Uh, and then certainly you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. And I would ask questions. This is, a, this is a rare chance for you to speak with an admissions professional. It's not just over email, which can be a little less uh, personal. Um, but feel free to ask questions about scholarships and about um, the admissions process. When can you expect a decision? Um, when, uh, when will you uh, be able to register for courses? What are the, what's the housing situation? like at the school or the, the community. These are all fair topics, fair questions. We get them constantly. Um, talking about the size of the program uh, is also something that you might be interested in as well. So um, it, it's always good to have questions. I would have one or two at least to ask uh, simply to show that you're curious about the school and about the program. Okay. So that's a general structure for how the interview usually works. Um, and then we'll wrap things up. And usually after my interviews, I can have a decision to students within one week, maybe a few days, um, to tie up the admissions piece. <clears throat> a few tips for a good interview. Um, just as you think about this final stage in your admissions process, uh, scheduling can be tricky. I know that, and I want you to know that. Um, most admissions professionals are very, I think, can be very reasonable when it comes to timing of the interviews. We realize that there are um, you know, time differences on different sides of the world uh, and that time is valuable. So trying to keep the interview within 20 to 30 minutes is uh, one goal, but then also being a little bit flexible. I've come in early in the morning for interviews. I've had interviews late in the, in the evening sometimes. Most of my interviews tend to be in the morning on the East Coast time, um, which tends to work for, for some of our applicants who, have, uh, who are a few hours ahead of us. So uh, just know that you know, if you have to reschedule or if, um, if you have trouble finding a time, that's okay. That won't hurt you during the admissions decision because we realize that with the time differences, there are some um, additional complications sometimes. Uh, also, this is, this is very important. Um, ensure you have or that you can access strong internet. Uh, I realize in some parts of the world, um, internet, the internet can be very slow. Um, so, so make sure, try to test out your connection before, if you have to go to a location, maybe outside of your office or to an internet cafe, um, maybe, maybe do that before your interview just to test and make sure that everything is running smoothly. If it isn't, that's okay. That happens relatively frequently. Uh, an interview will be interrupted by a lost signal. 
Uh, again, that is not detrimental to your admissions decision. It's just something that um, you know we can maybe try to prepare for and try to avoid. Uh, also, try to have a backup plan. So if a Skype connection does not work, uh, typically a phone call, phone conversation uh, can be something we can do fairly easily right after that also. So have a phone number ready. Uh, my preference is to call you so that you don't have the you don't incur the charges of an international phone call. Uh, so so just have the the phone phone number ready in case uh, the Skype connection doesn't go too well. Um, I would also assume that you'll be on video or camera, especially if we're on Skype. I always request first that our candidates appear on camera just so I can see you and and uh, you can see me as well. I think that's important for a personal connection. Um, if during the conversation the connection gets a little bit um, tricky, gets a little bit strained, um, we can easily turn off the cameras and that usually improves the quality of the connection and the sound. But I like to start off with the video and, and try to maintain that throughout the, the interview. Uh, another piece of advice, I don't know how, how often this is given, um, is you know, review your materials before the interview. Um, I think it's just generally good to, to get a refresh and a uh, reacquaintance of uh, application materials that you may have put together months ago or weeks ago, uh, but you want to make sure that they're fresh in your mind, uh, maybe run through your personal statement again, uh, go through your, your transcripts, which I'm sure you're, you're all, all well familiar with anyway, but your, your resume and your personal statement. Uh, just read through those again. Uh, it's helpful to... to um, be acquainted with that information. I use the information in your personal statement and your resume to ask you follow-up questions. So it will avoid perhaps any um, unpredictability or unanticipated uh, questions. Also, as I said earlier, you should ask questions. Feel free. Uh, there will be opportunity to ask questions. And again, it's a good sign that you're genuinely curious and interested in learning more about the program. Uh, I always enjoy the opportunity to answer questions because uh, it will um, it will show me that you're you, you've maybe done some homework, done some research about the school, about the program, really thinking about plans to come. So, uh, also, it's it's advisable that you've reviewed my school's website. If we're having an interview, um, maybe you've just gone through the web and you've maybe watched one or two videos about our school. You've reviewed the curriculum a bit. We have information on our website about scholarships and the bar exam and connecting with our students. And there's a lot on our website. So um, we have photos and videos, as I said. So um, take a few minutes, maybe before the interview, to just get reacquainted with the school. Learn a little bit about some of our, um, if you haven't done so already, our academic strengths, um, some of our institutes, maybe our faculty. Um, again, I think it will help generate questions that you might have as you as you review our materials, but also it will show a genuine interest and curiosity in our program. So, again, very helpful to do. Um, also, certainly, I mean, I, I hope this goes without saying, but an interview should be a conversation. So while you want to be prepared for uh, prepared to discuss substantive topics related to your background and your goals. Um, avoid pre-written answers. It's, it's always obvious when students are reading from a script uh, or, or um, reading directly from their application. That's, that's clear. Um, I've had you know, maybe one or two times in the last five years a student was also receiving translation during the interview, you know, having my answers translated and then receiving translation. So it's, it's, it's clear when that occurs um, and is certainly avoidable. So um, please do so. And uh, you know, like I said, this should really just be an informal, enjoyable conversation. Uh, and so with that, don't be nervous. Um, you know, it's, it's the opportunity for us after the review of the application and probably a few emails back and forth. This is finally the enjoyable piece of the admissions process where we're almost finished, we're just about complete, ready to make a decision, um, and so let's just have a conversation and talk about you and about uh, our school and how best can we make all of this work uh, for your benefit. So, 
I think we're getting towards the end. I do want to highlight uh, quickly a little bit about our own LLM program. You can see here, this is one of our recent classes of LLM students. They come from all over the world. I think our current class of students is around uh, 35, represented by about 23 different countries. Our LLM is one academic year. It's two semesters. Uh, you will be integrated with our JD students for all of your elective courses. Uh, we do offer enrollment in the fall semester as well as the spring, so we have some flexibility. We also offer conditional admission, so if your English needs to be improved a bit or you'd like to come to study legal English with us over the summer, highly recommended as well. Um, and then we also offer some significant uh, support for our LLM students. You'll have a faculty advisor. We have JD students who are mentors for our LLM students. You have myself, I have other staff as well. Uh, there's, there's a lot of support, a lot of layers of uh, assistance, and so I think it adds to the value of the overall experience for our, our students. So, With that, I want to thank you very much for your time. This has been uh, a pretty concise <laughs> uh, webinar, but I hope complete, and I hope you've learned something along the way. Um, and certainly would welcome the opportunity for any questions that you might have. I've also given you my uh, email address here, so you can feel free to email me anytime with follow-up as well. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for this uh, uh, really uh, insightful talk. I mean, uh, personal statement is uh, one of the uh, you know essential components of the admissions. Program. Very valuable content that uh, you have given over here uh, on applying for, or rather, you know what goes into a good personal statement. To all the attendees who are present over here. Uh, I should have informed you in the beginning itself, but uh, you know there is an option for you to ask uh, the question. So if you have any questions for Andrew, you can just type it into this question or the chat box, and uh, we can ask Andrew the question. So if you if you have any questions, then uh, please feel free to uh, type it out. And in the meantime, uh, you know based on what you have. Uh, discussed over here Andrew there is one uh, thing that comes to mind like who are the people who read the uh, personal statement say for example there is a personal statement does it gets uh, get read by the professor the admissions committee how many people uh, can you expect uh, uh, to, to read a personal statement that's a very good question and I actually wanted to mention that but um, I, I ended up just moving right to the presentation so uh, that's great. So every, every law school, every program you apply to will have an admissions committee. There will usually be a point person like myself who will be your primary point of contact. You can guarantee that that person uh, will read your personal statement. So I will read all of them. If I'm interviewing you, I've also read your personal statement. And I would say for the Masters of Law, for the LLM programs, Mostly, uh, you're, you're dealing with perhaps one admissions professional like myself. Uh, there may be some consultation towards the end of the uh, decision process where at the end I, I connect with one of my faculty colleagues. We maybe talk about a dis an admissions decision as well as perhaps a scholarship decision. But for the most part, for, for the LLM programs, um, it's one person and it would be a single point of contact, someone like myself who's directing the program. Um, it's possible in a, in a J, for a JD program, uh, for the example, the two-year JD program or the SJD program, the doctoral program, uh, those typically, those applications will be reviewed by a committee of faculty members as well. Committee is, is an interesting term in higher ed. You know, you can have a committee of two people or a committee of eight people sometimes. Um, but for the, the two-year accelerated JD and the SJD, the doctoral program, you can, you can expect that your personal statements will be reviewed by a committee, more than one person, and that that committee will include members of the faculty also. Uh, thank you, Andrew. So there are two questions uh, which uh, has been typed out. So uh, the first question is from Rishika. Uh, so Rishika asks, uh, 
you know, uh, whether, uh, uh, you know, can you elaborate on the kind of re resumes which is recommended? So uh, along with the personal statement, I presume what she means is that along with the personal statement, uh, is there a resume that needs to be submitted? And if this resume needs to be submitted, and what kind of resume is recommended? Is yep. it like a one-page resume or, uh, you know, what kind of resume is recommended? Yep, typically, yeah, absolutely. So in terms of the resume, that, that's a traditional requirement for all of these programs. It's helpful for us to know, um, I, I guess the, the purpose of the resume really is in one place, maybe one page or two pages if necessary. Uh, it gives us a chronology of your academic and professional background. So. It, it provides us with a quick look at, okay, this is where the student has attended school, this is when they graduated or when they plan to graduate, and then here's some of the work that they've done either in school or since that. Um, so it, it should be uh, relatively um, concise. It's, it's not a narrative, obviously, and like a personal statement. Um, I read many resumes that use the Europass model, so if, you, if you're coming from Europe or if you've, if you've applied into programs in Europe, uh, the Europass, the Erasmus uh, model for resumes is certainly acceptable. I think traditionally, as long as the resume has your personal information uh, as well as your education background, so the degrees you've received, the institutions you've attended, the years you've graduated or completed your education, as well as a chronology of your um, professional experience, maybe where you have interned in school and perhaps also where you're working after school. Um, give you know, a, a listing, more or less, of where you have worked, uh, and then maybe two or three bullet points of the types of job responsibilities you had at each of those places of employment or those internships helpful to just provide a little bit more context into what you're actually doing. Uh, there, are, there are plenty of resume formats available online. As I said, the Europass format is, is generally popular and accepted for a lot of students. I would be happy also to share uh, some resume guidelines. We have a document we use for our, our current students as well. Uh, but keep it basic, keep it very simple. As I said, it should really just be a brief chronology of your academic and professional background. Thank you, Andrew. So there are a couple of more questions that is coming. So uh, I have a question from, uh, I have actually two questions from uh, Anagha. Uh, she asks, uh, like, uh, in, in the, her specific question, this question is, are there specific points for grammar slash uh, language usage in the, in the personal statement and could a lesser language variant of uh, the personal statement affect admissions? What she means uh, perhaps is that uh, if, uh, if there is any, any criteria, like when you read the uh, personal statement and see that there is the, the grammar is not used properly or a spell check is not done properly, uh, does that adversely uh, affect uh, a, a prospective student's application? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Um, so I can speak on behalf of Syracuse, and I think this is uniform across most other programs, my colleagues at other schools. Uh, you know, I, there's, no, there's no sort of mathematical point system or rubric that we're using to really grade a personal statement as we would maybe an academic paper. So um, it's more of an organic assessment that we make as we read your personal statement. We're looking for how, how clean does it read. Um, you know, as I said, grammatical errors are, are, are certainly something you should avoid, but they're, they're everywhere. Even our American JD applicants also make grammatical errors. So ideally what we're trying to do is we obviously will hopefully have, um, in most cases, a TOEFL score, an IELTS score, or if you're coming from a country where English is an official language or you're a native English speaker, that, that's helpful as well. Um, but we're, we're trying to make sure that the quality of the personal statement is consistent with um, the proficiency you've demonstrated in the TOEFL or IELTS, for example. Um, but as I said, you know, um, take some time to proofread your personal statement. It's not something that you'll be graded on or receive a score for. It more or less just gives us sort of an organic impression of maybe how, how detailed were you when writing the statement, how careful were you. Um, 
it's just sort of a general observation. Thank you, Andrew. There is another question uh, from uh, Vahini. Uh, she asks, how long will it take to know whether my application has been considered and will be announced that I'll be called for an interview. Uh, so how long does the application process take? And uh, if there is an interview that is there, how long before she comes to know about it? Yep, absolutely. So typically uh, what we'll do is we'll receive your application. Hopefully your application will include all of your supplemental materials like your personal statement, like your resume. If it doesn't include everything, then pretty quickly after receiving your application, maybe two, three, four days, someone from our office, my office, would contact you uh, to identify those materials that we still need. Um, we like to wait on scheduling the interview until we have your complete application materials because we'd like to review everything before we speak with you. So if we're still waiting for a few letters of recommendation or if you still need to submit your resume, for example, um, we'd like to hold off on the interview until we have everything. So in some, some ways, it depends in part on the applicant and whether and how quickly you can submit all of your materials. Once we have a complete application, I'd say within one to two weeks, you can expect to have your interview. So I like to, once I get your complete application, I send you immediately an email with uh, information on when to schedule a Skype call. I hold my Skype calls mostly Wednesday morning and Thursday morning every week. I have my, my calendar blocked off. So if you have, for example, say this week, if I receive your complete application this week, I'll try to email you right away and then plan a call for next Wednesday or Thursday morning if you're, if you're uh, available. Um, and so, you know, depending on the schedule, that can take one week or two weeks. And then after the interview, uh, within a week, I can turn around an admissions decision fairly quickly. At that point, it it's, becomes easier to make the decision and um, easier to generate your, your admission letters. So in total, from start to finish, you know, from, from the day you submit your first piece of application, whether it's just the application itself until you have a decision, assuming we're all sort of working quickly and, and on time, can take about two to three weeks. Thank you, Andrew. There is a, a, another question, uh, again from uh, Anaga. Uh, the question is that uh, for a person who is currently uh, pursuing an LLB program in India, that is it, like LLB is the undergraduate law program in India, uh, if uh, they wish to get into a JD program, uh, can, can the number of years uh, for studying the JD program be reduced or uh, will, will they still have to continue with the three-year uh, JD uh, once again? Yes. So is there some question. additional courses to bridge the gap? Yep, so actually I'm, I'm going to move my, if I can, oh, I think I'm, here we go. So yes, so the, the short answer to that question is we have our three-year JD degree, which is the traditional three-year program. However, if you are a foreign student who's completing a bachelor's in law, so an LLB degree from another jurisdiction, another country, um, we can reduce the amount of time you need in the JD uh, because we will, the American Bar Association allows us to accept in as transfer credit some of your, not, not all, but some of your foreign credits. And so we can transfer in enough to satisfy one of the three years that it takes to complete the three-year JD. It's our accelerated JD program here. And so it's, it's basically the same program. You would start your, your first year would be the first year curriculum. It's very lockstep, very uh, structured. And then your second year would be more electives. And then you would leave with the same same JD, Juris Doctor degree that all of our other JD degrees leave with. So uh, the admissions process for that is, is fairly uh, distinct. Uh, we, we accept, we collect the same admissions materials. There will be a Skype interview also. Uh, and then we do have a faculty committee who also reviews those applications as an additional layer uh, just to make sure the, the JD degree is very difficult, even for our American students. Uh, they're graded on a very competitive grading curve, uh, and it moves very fast. 
And so um, we tend to give a little bit more scrutiny. We're a little bit more selective with our admissions for the accelerated JD because it is just so difficult. So. One other question is that, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the interview, how common is, is an interview? So do all people who apply through a written application and after submitting the application and personal statement, are all of them uh, called for an interview or is it only certain selected people where you really need to know some further information? Is it, yeah. uh, uh, does the practice vary from law school to law school or is there any set uh, criteria for that? It really, it really does vary from law school to law school. I can tell you here at Syracuse, uh, we interview everyone. Uh, as long as you're eligible for the program, so if your degrees, um, you have the threshold required degrees, uh, and as long as you are, um, uh, yes, so as long as you have our, our admissions requirements, excuse me, uh, we will interview everyone, okay? Uh, now, there are other programs, other law schools that I know of who receive, you know, thousands of applications a year um, and simply are not able to interview every candidate. So they may interview students who uh, have grades who are maybe, or, or academic profiles that are maybe on the fence, maybe they're not quite sure if they can make a clear admission decision, but there's something about the application that warrants a follow-up conversation with you to get a better sense of, of you and, and uh, your goals. So um, it really depends school by school. I, have, I know other colleagues at other schools, they don't interview anyone. They, uh, they look only at the documentation that you've provided and they make a decision. You know, I, that, that's certainly one way to, to run an admissions operation and I, I don't make any judgment against it. I do think that uh, you're missing a valuable opportunity to have a personal conversation, connection with, with the school and with the applicant. So um, I hope to be continuing to do the interviews for a long time because of that, um, it may be that we get to a point where because of the volume of applications, we have to maybe change how we do the interviews, or I have colleagues who will do them for me. But for right now, here at Syracuse, I'll still, I, I, I will interview everyone uh, and have those conversations. Uh, another question that has just come in is that in, in the event that a person is transferring uh, to do a JD accelerated program, would they still yeah. be required to do, uh, to take the LSATs? Yep, so here at, Syracuse, yep, here at Syracuse, the LSAT exam is not required for the accelerated JD program. I know that's, that's something that every school treats differently. I have other colleagues who require it, other colleagues who don't require it. Um, if you have an LSAT score, we'll, we'll see that, and we take that into consideration just as we would any other piece of your application. But if you don't have the LSAT score, it does not make you ineligible for the program. So if there is any further question, please feel free to type it. Um, I, I think that is about it, Andrew, with, uh, with the questions. And uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And uh, thank you for all the insights. Um, so if you have anything further to add, please uh, do, do let us know. Absolutely. I just want to thank you and uh, thank all of our attendees today. I hope it was informative. And uh, certainly feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.